<laughs> oh, we're on the air. Excellent. Give me a second as I start the class. All right, shall we begin? Shh. Chatter, 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 whisper, whisper, whisper. Am I mic'd? You can hear me, yeah? Okay, good. This is the second last class. Are you guys sad? Oh! Not even the decency to lie. Oh, my goodness. Well, it's not the last class. I can still punish you. <laughs> because of the second last class, there's still going to be some new stuff today, but very little new stuff. Because I am exhausted. I've already got two hours sleep here, and I think I'm diabetic now because I had this, all these Timbits. And, uh. So, um, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah, so today's topic is actually uh, pretty short. Maybe we can get you out in half an hour. We'll see if, if all goes well. On topics in which I have no expertise. Uh, environmental epidemiology and molecular epidemiology, two fields that I know very little about, so I won't pretend to go deep into them, and I'll hopefully just introduce the topic. I don't expect you to be the experts, just have a general understanding of what we're talking about. And yes, there'll be a, one or two questions on the exam on this, uh, on this topic, but it's not the meat and potatoes of, of the course. Uh, before I get into that, though, Saturday is, of course, a big poster day. Yay! You're all ready to go, right? So uh, I think there's a couple of people who haven't paid yet on PayPal. I will track you down tonight and email you, just to remind you, uh, and to get around that, because it really saves a lot of problems on Saturday if you get the, um, the stuff done first on PayPal. Right? So this class, we are scheduled for the afternoon on Saturday. So please come at noon. Please come at noon on the dot if you can. If you come earlier than noon, uh, you can, but you're kind of taking up space and you're kind of busy. If you come earlier than noon, please stay out of the way because uh, Dr. Gomez's class will be doing their shtick and it'll be a lot of bodies there. Uh, but you can, you can come watch. If you come at noon, uh, go to the registration desk, enter your name, they'll check you off, give you your, your, your number for where your poster goes because the poster boards will be numbered and labeled and you must go to where your number is because the judges have already been given the list of posters that they're judging, and they're labeled by, by numbers. Yes? You're there until 4. However, if you have to leave, you've got to go somewhere, you can go after you've been judged twice. Right? And if you're, if you're still lingering and you've got to go, come see me. I'll see if I can work something out. Okay? But in general, stay until 4. There are going to be prizes at the end. We'll announce the prizes, so stay until the end. Uh, if you come at noon, to that's when lunch will be served. It's pizza, so and you're paying for it already, so... Make sure you come for your food. Uh, what else? Yes, so um, the way it works is, if I haven't explained already, shh, you've been so, been so agitated today. So uh, is a judge will come around twice. You'll be judged at least twice, sometimes three times. Some people get judged three times. That's good for you. The more judging, the more at, your marks average out, right? So you get 10 minutes to summarize your work to the judges, and you will be timed. And after that, the judges will give uh, questions for about five minutes. Sometimes it'll go over a little bit, but in general, five minutes of questioning, ten minutes for you to explain yourselves. And each one of you in the group must say something. So what are you going to say? You're going to describe why you chose your question, your methodology, your results, your discussion. Try not to read off the poster. Have a discussion with them. Don't bullshit the judges. So um, I will take the judges aside just before they begin with special instructions. Among the instructions I will give them is look for bullshit, <laughs> right? Punish that nonsense. You're having a scientific conversation. You're going to be honest with your failings. And if they say, you know, um, this is wrong, you, uh, don't say, oh, it was totally right. I checked with a Nobel Prize winning statistician. Don't lie. We know, we know better. Just I didn't think of that. No, that's okay. Um, the other thing they'll be looking for is systematicity. So how systematic, how well thought out a priori were your methods and how, uh, how appropriate uh, were your methods for answering the question that you posed and how cognizant were you of the biases and the qualities of the papers that you found. If all the papers you found are crap, that's okay. That's not your fault, right? But hopefully you were able to ascertain that they're a crap using the epidemiological skills of bias and so forth. And uh, right, there it is. Yeah. Any questions about post your day? We'll go over this again on Thursday. Yes. 
Oh, I forgot about that. I got to ask again on Thursday. Sorry about that. Remind me. Email, someone email me. Remind me. And I'll check with the organizers. Okay. Uh, right. Cool. Okay. Moving on. So again, today's topic is tree huggers. Yeah. Good times is environmental and molecular epidemiology, and in the past it was two separate lectures. I've stripped away um, the extra stuff and combined them into one because it's not it's uh, it's not again the meat and potatoes of this course, but something you might be interested in if you go into this field as a career. There are subcategories of epidemiology, and these are two subcategories. So let's begin with molecular epidemiology. Now, molecular and genetic epidemiology are, I've been led to understand, two actually subtly different. Subsciences, I don't fully understand the uh, the subtle distinction between the two, so I'm going to pretend that they're the same. And if you pretend they're the same, obviously I can't penalize you for that because I've told you they're kind of the same. But the experts tell me that they're not the same. So let's go forward and see what they kind of look like. Um, the term was first used by a guy named Kilborn in '73, and it talks about biomarkers. And you've learned about biomarkers in your other classes, in your biology classes. And what's a biomarker? Um, it can either be one or two things. Something we introduce into an organism that allows us to track them, like a, a radioactive tag of some kind. Or more commonly, what we talk about with um, molecular epidemiology is something innate to the organism. So something uh, that changes molecularly within an organism in response to a disease state. <clears throat> so molecular epidemiology is a way of marrying what we've learned so far in population epidemiology with molecular biology, a way of really the epidemiology of things at the molecular level. And as we'll see, um, also associating genetic factors with environmental and behavioral factors. Like I said, it's very similar to genetic epidemiology, but there's a subtle difference, and I always can't ascertain and massage my way through that subtle difference. So let's pretend that they're the same for now. So um, because I'm not an expert in this field, I've stolen all these slides, again, from uh, the super course. And again, if you haven't been in the super course, I encourage you to go to the super course website. It's open access, free slides. I've forgotten exactly where these ones come from. But for the purpose of people watching on the internet, these are not my slides. These are slides I've stolen, not illegally. OK. So uh, we remember that descriptive epidemiology is looking at things like you know uh, effects or outcomes of diseases, um, things like that. Analytical epidemiology is ascertaining the relationship between variables, in this case, host characteristics, environmental characteristics. And just like population epidemiology, we use relative risks and odds ratio. So the math is the same. It's just the things that we're measuring are subtly different. So analytical molecular epidemiology looks at genetic susceptibility. So are you predetermined? Are you uh, predisposed to having a certain condition? I just made a joke about probably being diabetic now because I had a bunch of Timbits. Well, diabetes runs in my family. I'm at that age now. I'm a fit guy. But doesn't mean that even though I've done all the right things behaviorally that I won't get diabetes because I have a predisposition to it based upon my, my genetics. Right? So uh, with genetic and or molecular epidemiology, we try to account for the biological predispositions, the biomarkers. Um, it's not all about exposures. Right? So if you consider, look back to the examples I've given you throughout the class, like um, the picnic examples, where you're looking at outbreaks of this disease, and we do our case control analyses, and we try to figure out which of the things that you ate probably created the diarrhea. Well, that is based on the assumption that everyone there had an equal chance of getting the diarrhea based upon the thing they're exposed to. With genetic and molecular epidemiology, we accept that some people may have lesser or higher chances of getting the outcome given their genetics, even though they both have the same levels of exposure. So it's a little more subtle, and it accepts the heterogeneity of different people's biologies, which is why it's growing in, in popularity and has a bit more uh, uh, sexiness right now in the wider field. So the environmental risk factors we tend to assess are things like where you live, what you do for a uh, living, uh, and the biological markers of exposure, well, alterations to your genome, whether you have antibodies, infectious agents introduced into your, into your system. Um, a lot of these things here really aren't a bit too precise. Skip that, skip that slide. Really, the essence of this is that we're looking for an element of a genetic predisposition plus exposure. If you've got the predisposition and you're exposed, you're at high risk. If you're missing one of these things, you're at low risk. 
And that's the essence of what I'm talking about. A combination of a predisposition. What's going on me? And you probably noticed that Kahina's lecture last week, I uploaded the audio. Everybody noticed that? So uh, that worked out better than the YouTube does. Interesting. OK, you asked the question about whether or not the, um, the regression analysis looks at just one variable. It looks at all the variables, but we use it because we, c we could look at the influence of one variable, one cofactor on the outcome, given that everything else has been controlled for. And the example I was going to give you was in here, we're trying to figure out, is exposure to a landfill uh, uh, increase your risk of having cancer? And the question is, let's say you live in a landfill, but you also smoke. How do you know it's not the smoking that's causing the cancer and not living next to the landfill? And the answer is, with regression, we get enough people living in the landfill, some who smoke and some who don't, that statistically we can separate out the risk caused by smoking and remove that out so we only get the risk caused by the landfill. And the same thing is true for all the other variables in our soup. We can remove all these things so that we only get the smoking contribution. Remove all these things so we only get the ethnicity contribution. That's why we love regression. Almost every master's degree in epidemiology involves a logistic regression because we all know how to do it and we get some nice little results. And regression gives us a list of odds ratios that have been adjusted. They've been controlled for. And we'll see what that looks like in a couple seconds. Oh, right here. That's what it looks like. So this, you probably come across charts like this when you did your literature review for the poster. And maybe some of you figured out how to do it, and maybe some of you haven't, but we'll go through this example here. So this is the ecological analysis results, and this is the case control analysis results. And here we're looking at the risks for cancer. It says here relative risks, but they're actually here, it's odds ratios. That's your odds ratios. Remember, odds ratios estimate relative risks. So sometimes they will just say relative risk when they mean odds ratios. And here's our, these are the, um, the predictors of cancer. And here are the relative risk and odds ratios. So this is the 95% confidence interval. Remember that from stats class? That means that if I were to do this experiment a billion times, 95% of the time, the result will be in that range. Now, what's the magic number for odds ratios of relative risk? That tells us nothing's happening. One. So we don't want to find a one. A one tells us this thing has no effect. If I were to produce this uh, uh, experiment a billion times, I would get something between 0.5 and 1.3. Is one in there? Yeah, one is in there. So we know that is actually statistically equal to one. Same with that. Same with that. Same with that. Same with that, same with that, same with all of these here, except for that guy. How about over here? Is one in between these two? No, it's not. And here, yes, 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 yes. So if I were to cross all these off, these are the ones in which one is in the confidence interval range. It's a really simple way to read the chart. And that leaves me with just these, two exa these three examples here. So in an ecological analysis, uh, Stomach cancer, there's a relative risk of being exposed to the landfill site and getting stomach cancer if you live in a high area, and of getting liver cancer if you live in a high area. Everything else doesn't seem to have an effect. So and here is uh, a deeper analysis of the case control study looking at the odds ratio. Here it says adjusted odds ratio and the confidence intervals. These are all including one. So our case control doesn't give us a whole lot of information either. So we found we found there's a slightly different results obtained with different methodology. If we use the uh, the ecological versus the case control methods, we get slightly different interpretation. So if we go back here, our case control gives us nothing, and our ecological gives us a little bit of something. We get like a stomach cancer, maybe a slight, slightly increased risk. So we have inconclusive results except for a couple of the cancers. So we conclude further studies are needed from other landfill sites. That's the classic conclusion for every study. Further studies are needed. It justifies our next grant application. Okay. okay. Another quick example. We'll finish off with this quick example. This is a, a complex longitudinal cohort study. What's a longitudinal cohort study? Yes.
Yeah, yeah. I think longitudinal cohort is kind of redundant. All cohorts are pretty much longitudinal. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's probably suggesting it's for a really long time. You're right. <laughs> Very clever. All right. And this is looking at the effects of um, air pollution on different kinds of cancer. And what they've done in these studies is looked at a whole host of covariates, a whole host of factors that may be responsible for or associated with uh, something, mostly with, well, I think, mortality. Okay? And if you want to read more about this example, go to this site here. So uh, 8,000 subjects made randomly from six U.S. cities, different levels of air pollution. We follow them every two years. Um, we looked at lung function and questionnaires, and we looked at uh, air exposure. So uh, we looked at mortality as our outcome. Don't worry about this means stratified Cox proportional hazards. That's just one of the techniques. And we get these numbers. Relative risks of mortality according to these factors. How do you read this? The way you read this is we look for the ones that don't contain one. There's a one in here. There's a one in here. There's no one there. There's a one in here. There's no one here. So the first one which there's no one is here. Percentage of net change in number of residents between these years. So as the change in residence has increased, fewer people are dying. This shows us that uh, population density is protective, which is a weird thing. Uh, what this shows here? This shows us that Gini coefficient, that's income. So the richer this population is, the less likely they are to die. And so forth. You can go through each of these individually. But that's how you read that kind of data. And an environmental population epidemiologist will, will crunch all those, all those data, uh, attach an odds ratio or relative risk to each risk factor covariate, and determine which factor is most appropriate or most likely to be associated with the outcome that we care about. What good is this? Why do we want to know this? Is there a reason? Is there a reason I want to know that the wealthier a community is, the less likely they'll die of, of air poisoning? Or uh, here as uh, altitude above sea level, right? More likely to die of uh, air poisoning. How are these things relevant? Why do we care? Yes. Exactly. Depending on what we're looking at, it can inform practice or policy. Some of these things are just coincidental, right? So the wealthier po the population, the less likely they are to die. Well, that has to do with a lot of things. Maybe it's because the wealthier the population, the more services there are, or the less likely they are to be outside because they've got office jobs, they've got air conditioning. I don't know. It may not be indicative of anything. But occasionally we find something that we can act on, like, I don't know, um, the density of cars is associated with increased air pollution deaths. We can actually affect policy to diminish the density of cars. We have to be careful, though. We do this kind of analysis. Um, we can go on fishing expeditions. We throw in all the variables we can think of, and you'll find that something comes out significant. And suddenly, you've got uh, all this kind of policy uh, geared towards, if you wear gray scarves, you're more likely to have butt cancer. Makes, you know, there's no obvious association there. Right. Um, but with a large enough sample size, you can find anything. That's really the last slide there. I was rambling at the end. Um, <laughs> that's the last new thing we'll cover in this class. So on Thursday, I will talk about the final exam, which is next Wednesday, by the way. And um, we'll also talk about the poster again. Any questions before I close up? Look at that. Quick and dirty. Thank you very much. <laughs>